A Mother's Story What Midwives Can Learn From Women Like Me Where do I start? How do I begin to tell you, someone I don't know, about my life? My story. I was 12 weeks pregnant when I found out. It was a total shock. And although I knew that we'd have to have social workers involved, have assessments done, I wanted to avoid having to tell anyone. In fact, looking back, I feel like I was avoiding the fact I was pregnant at all. I think it was just my subconscious way of dealing with it, you know, just in case. I should have been happy, but instead I was in a state all the time. It really was a rough pregnancy for me. I just felt drained completely. The extra stress of having social workers literally on my case, watching my every move, it was awful. One day I'd laid on the sofa because I didn't feel well. The social worker made a report that I shouldn't be doing that in the middle of the afternoon. You know, I should have been making plans about the future, but I was just terrified. Every time he moved, I cried. I didn't want to accept that I was pregnant, because if I did, it would mean I'd have to think about what would happen when he was born. It made my pregnancy horrible. I didn't enjoy one minute of it, not like I should have. I didn't buy much for the baby either, because I just didn't know what was going to happen. I did buy a teddy though. It's nice, isn't it? I saw it in a shop window, and it was like I had to have that at least, so that if or when they took him, he would have something that I'd bought him. He used to go everywhere with him after he was born. But when we were in the hospital, I kept it tucked inside my T-shirt so it would pick up my scent. So, you know, when he took it with him to the foster carers, she could put it in his cot when he was unsettled and things. Because new babies can smell the mothers, did you know that? The midwife didn't tell me that. I read it in a book. The midwife I had when I was pregnant was not particularly nice to me. I mean, she was never horrible to me. She was always polite, but it was very business-like. It was get you in, do the tests we need, take the measurements, get you out kind of thing. She never once asked me if I was okay, did I need any help or support to help me deal with what was happening. I felt like a lost cause. While I know there's a stigma around women who have children removed, you should be able to trust your midwife to do what's best for you. No matter what you've done in the past, they should still try and help you to make yourself a better person so you can give your baby a better life. I don't think I've told you yet. I was pregnant with a little boy. I named him Dylan. I was 37 weeks pregnant when they finally told me that they would be removing my baby at birth and placing him into foster care. I remember the day I had him like it was yesterday. It was both the best and the worst day of my life. I had him on a Friday tea time, quarter to five, nine pound eight ounces. He was gorgeous. He really was. I tried not to bond, but you can't help it, can you? Straight away the midwife put him skin to skin on me, and I loved it. My instincts just took over. It was such a happy moment, but it also wasn't because I knew I wasn't going to be allowed to keep him. It was brilliant at the time, but looking back now, I'm not sure if it was the right thing to do. It was kind of cruel. Oh, I don't know. It was all just so surreal. I'd just finished feeding him, and another midwife came in with a fish tank. As I, that's what I call them. Right, I'm going to take you down to the ward. So if we toddled to the ward, I was asked, do you want a wheelchair? And I said, no, it's fine. I'll push him. I knew I couldn't keep him. It was just a matter of time before they came for him. But for that moment, with him in his little tank, my bag on the side, and being able to push him down the ward like a proper mum, I felt so proud. We arrived on the postnatal ward, and they said, this is where you're going to be staying. I was a bit surprised, really. My room was right next to the door to leave the ward. So if I'd wanted to, I could have left with him in my arms and no one would have stopped me. I wouldn't have done that though. I wouldn't have done anything that might hurt him or give them anything else to use against me. So my room was a single room at the end of the corridor. 
I don't think they wanted me on the ward with the other mums, so they put me in a little room on my own. I had my own bathroom and everything, all attached to the room. It was nice enough in there, but it did feel like we don't want her around the other babies kind of thing. I know that probably wasn't it. It was to give me privacy. But to me, it felt as though I was being kept away from the other babies, away from the other mothers, the real mothers. I've always joked about it. So there's quite a few people who have been very strange with me since everything with Angel. I used to say to people, you won't catch bad parenting, you know. It's not a disease. It was their prejudice, but I used to make a joke out of it. Because if you don't laugh at something, you'll cry, right? Well, I do think it would be best to give each woman the choice. I mean, I would have liked to have been in the bigger room with all the other mothers and babies, but I can understand how some women might not like that, especially if solicitors and social workers are in and out. People aren't stupid, they know what's going on. There's no privacy in the big wards. And to take a, p a baby from its mother in a shared room is so embarrassing. We should be treated like everyone else and asked. Asked where we'd like to be. But that doesn't happen. We're made to feel like we can't be trusted around kids. That we're to be watched at all times. Although they couldn't have been that worried about me, they left me to look after Dylan all weekend by myself. I've kept everything from the hospital. His name bands, congratulation cards, his first baby grow, blanket, vest, a dirty old plaster from where he had his blood tests. I keep it all in this cupcake tin. It sits on my windowsill, next to where I sit at home. Something that I get out when I'm down, you know? Not to remember, but to get comfort. I can still smell him on his blanket. I keep that in a polythene bag so the smell stays in. I try not to open it too much. I also managed to get the peg thing off his card when it fell off. His foster carer gave me that. She was really good. She also let me get some paints out in the contact visit so I could make prints of his hands and feet. She was amazing. I think it would have been nice to offer to do those things in the hospital. Maybe being able to bathe the baby. Things you don't think about at the time. Now I wish I'd done them. I never got to bathe him. And I know it sounds silly, but I would like to. It's what mothers do, isn't it? Because of the weekend, they couldn't get me in court until Monday. My solicitor said I should stay at the hospital and spend as much time with the baby as I could. But I didn't trust him. He could have said anything about me. So I decided I'd go to court. I took Dylan's hat. He'd worn it the first day. I took it for comfort. I just kept it in my pocket and kept squeezing it really tightly. I never gave up hope that one day I would take him home. If you've been following the story, I have kind of given it away that I didn't get to take Dylan home from hospital that day. My solicitor completely let me down. He said afterwards he should have fought harder to get me sent to a mother and baby unit. I don't really remember the journey back to the hospital. It's all a blur now. But I know I was in a terrible state when I got back there. The midwife was really lovely. She told me not to worry. She'd told the social worker that she'd not done Dylan's discharge papers yet. It might take her a little while as she was really busy. I could not take my eyes off the door. My heart skipped a beat every time someone came in. I expected any minute for the social worker to come in and say, get him dressed, I'm taking him. My partner's mum, bless her, she said she'll never forget my face every time that door opened for as long as she lives. I did think about just walking out, just leaving him in the room, but I just couldn't. They would probably have used it against me anyway. Said I didn't care or something like that, but it was torture. The next minute, the social worker came in. It was just the way she did it, really. It was, Lily, I come for him. She could have made a bit of effort, you know, maybe asked me his name. But I suppose she did let me put him in the car instead of taking him off me. But that's another thing that really pissed me off, the car seat. It was pink. I was really not happy about it. You know, he was a boy. If she'd have asked me, I would have bought him one. But she didn't care. It was the most bizarre thing. I gave Dylan a kiss. And I remember feeling stunned, like I was at a movie, watching everything happen. She was trying to be all efficient about it, checking the straps. You could see she didn't want to hang around. I really don't know how I kept it together. Then after handing over my baby, I had to do the walk of shame. 
through the postnatal ward, past all the other mums breastfeeding, to the front desk, and then out of the hospital. I was trying to keep myself together, but it was awful. I waited a good ten minutes for the social worker to leave. You know, to give me time to compose myself before I left. But as I passed through the reception, the social worker was still there. It was raining and she didn't want to take Dylan out in the rain. Can you believe she asked me to stand with him while she pulled the car round to reception? So I did, because after all, I didn't want my baby to get wet either. Then I stood in the rain as he drove away. I had absolutely no idea where he was going. All I knew was that he was going to someone called Maggie. I did get to meet her the next day at the contact centre. And looking back, I feel so lucky to have Maggie. Because the minute I did meet her, she was big smiles. She gave me a cuddle when she met me. You could tell there wasn't anything. There was no prejudice with Maggie. She wasn't looking at me in a certain way and I just knew she would look after him. In fact, I would have felt more settled if she had collected him from the hospital. She let me give him my rosary to hang over his crib. I liked that and it made me feel like he was being watched over, that something of mine was watching him. You probably think that sounds daft. I made this rag teddy as well, out of all of mine and Dylan's clothes. I think he liked it. Well, Maggie said he liked it. Looking back and knowing Maggie now, I think she would have come to the hospital to collect him when he was born. Maggie knew she was getting him from the day he was born. They'd rang her and told her to prepare her, so she would have had plenty of time to come and see him at the hospital, get to know him before taking him to her house. Surely that's better for everyone, isn't it? I personally think it's best if you meet the person your baby's going to be with because then you can put your mind at rest. You get a picture in your head of who is with your baby. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, leaving the hospital and going home without a baby. It's the worst thing ever. As a rule, most mums get to go home with their babies, but I couldn't and it was totally humiliating to walk in the front door with no baby. It was just horrible. So many people asked me in those early days, where's the baby? Why have you come out of hospital without the baby? I just didn't know what to say. It was so hard. So I said he hadn't been feeding properly. He was on the newborn unit. That's why he hadn't come home. But it didn't take long for gossiping to get round. Then they all knew I'd lied. That was humiliating. Once everyone found out, I became a recluse just hiding away. I didn't want to answer the door or face anyone. I did have a couple of friends who were on the phone messaging me, but to be honest, I wasn't even replying. I just wasn't in the mood to speak to anyone. It was so strange. It kind of reminds me of the behaviour of a more eel. They hide away and they live quite solitary lives. They're often attacked if they come out and swim in the open ocean, so they hide away for hours at a time. I can totally understand how they feel. I became a recluse in those early weeks. And to be honest, so many times I think it would have been easier if my baby had died. I've got a friend called Amber. She also had a baby removed at birth. We were only having this conversation the other day and we were both saying that, although it's a horrible thing to say and we wouldn't wish it on anyone, but we both agreed it had been easier if our babies had died. At least you know where you are then. Does that make sense? When they die, you have a place to go. But to know your kids are out there and you can't have them, it's a killer. I took the picture on the right, as to me, it shows the same path. Two different sides. One where grief and loss is recognised with the presence of a headstone. The other where there's nothing. Nothing to show or to acknowledge our babies. You see... If your baby dies, people understand death. People can relate to death. Everybody loses somebody at some point in their lives. People can support you with something like that. And they sympathise with you. But not for women like me. I know my baby hadn't died, but it felt like I was grieving. Because as far as I was concerned, he'd gone. And it really didn't help when people would say to me, well, yeah, but at least he hasn't died. Because to me, it did feel like it. I didn't have him, 
but I couldn't let go because he was still here. It is really confusing and it leaves you in limbo. I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this, am I? Well, have a look at this picture. It sums it up in a nutshell for me. Having Dylan taken at birth meant I couldn't make plans for the future. While I knew he was here and he was my baby and part of my life, he was also like a ghost by my side. You know, there but not there. I'm not sure why I kept this picture, really. I would normally delete the blurry ones. That's a lot of them now that he's running around. But something made me keep it. I know now it was to show you exactly how it felt for me. There were dark days and at times I used to question if I had had a baby at all. I also noticed people would cross the street to avoid me. First of all I took offence. Now I've realised it's just because people don't know what to say to me. That included the midwife. She never once asked how the baby was doing or anything like that. It just reinforced that feeling that I'd lost him. It would have been really nice if they could have told me if he was still feeding well. Was he still getting his wind up? Because, you know, I loved feeding him. Every time I woke up in the night, and it was a lot, I would think, is he awake? Is he having a bottle? And I would look out the window and see the moon in the sky, wonder if he could see it too. I think my body clock knew when he was awake, because when he was inside me, he always had a crazy hour in the night, and I used to feel him move around a lot. Anyway, all I can tell you is, it was horrible. My body had given birth, but I didn't have a baby. Looking back, I was definitely grieving. I really needed someone to be there for me. I felt like they shouldn't have just took him like that. The judge in the court hearing said I was young enough to start again. You know, have another child. I can imagine that might help some mothers come to terms with the loss. But for me, it's something I never, ever want to go through again. I've tried to move on, but I just can't. I do try and push it right to the back of my mind, but it just comes flooding back in. Then I'm in tears. Inconsolable. I feel like this most days. But I put on a bit of makeup, I smile, and I pretend to be happy. All I'm doing is hiding away the awful pain. I carry it inside. A bit like a clown. So there it is. That is my story. As for what midwives can do for someone like me, well, there's a few things. First of all, accept there is absolutely nothing that you can say or do that will make it any easier or any worse than it already is. But remember, it costs nothing to be kind. And it would be nice to have the same midwife. So I don't have to keep telling my story over and over again. If they come across women like me, women in this situation, don't judge them. Help them. Will you do that for me, please?